Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning, the scripture text is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, and I'm going to be reading verses 13 through 21, and this is what it says. And someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. And he said to him, man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a certain rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? And he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns, and I will build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods." Then I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for you for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Pray with me. Jesus, this day in worship, I ask that you speak, not just to our ears or our minds, but to our soul. And we might be transformed by it and, and become rich, rich toward you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The Gospel of Luke chapter 12 starts off with Luke telling a description of the scene. He says, and they were stepping on each other. Now that's crowded. So crowded they were stepping on each other. Jesus gives a sermon and during this sermon a heckler pipes up. Now I'll go ahead and let you know, the preachers don't really like hecklers in the audience. Yeah, it's, it's never one of the things that a preacher hopes for. And this, this heckler pipes up. And we, we read it this morning. In verse 13, he says, teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. You can almost hear the whine in his voice. Teacher, tell my brother to do, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it, and Jesus says, who appointed me? A judge or an arbiter over you. I mean, really down deep, what, what we all want is a is a righteous judge, somebody who, who makes people do what we think they ought to do. Someone who makes people behave. Someone who gets folks in line, especially the way that we see the line ought to be. But, but this man didn't get what he asked for. What he got in return was a parable. Jesus gives him a story, and the story starts out in, a, in an incredibly insightful way. It says, and Jesus told them a parable saying, the land of a certain rich man was very productive. I say it's very insightful because 
Temptation begins most often in prosperity, not in adversity. Temptation most often begins in abundance. The story starts off with a a certain rich man who had land that was very productive. It wasn't throwaway land. It it wasn't a little extra land. It wasn't land that he wasn't using. This was land that was very productive. As a matter of fact, it was more productive than he had ever imagined it would be. When someone builds a barn, they build a barn with imagination and a little bit of calculation in mind. They don't imagine what the average crop would be because that would mean that about half the time you throw away what you can't collect in. That the imagination that you build a barn with is imagining what your largest crop would be. If you build the barn too big, then you've spent your time, your resources, your land on something you'll never use. But you want your barn to be big enough for your biggest crop. Well, the land was so productive that he got more than enough, more than gracious plenty. And so his mind immediately went to, how can I have more for me and hold on to everything? So he tears down his old barns to build new ones. But that night, he dies. And now in the story Jesus is telling, God speaks to him. Now, whenever God speaks in a parable or anywhere in the Bible, it's time to listen. And this is what God says. You fool. He doesn't call him an evil man. He doesn't call him a bad man. He calls him a foolish man. He calls him a foolish man. And he he says, this very night, your soul is required of you. Who will own what you have prepared? And Jesus ends the parable by saying, So is the man who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. That the temptation comes in the, in the bountiful gifts in the prosperity when we have more than enough rather than turning toward God the temptation is turned toward self and to be rich toward self and not rich toward God so what what is it to be rich toward God well that's what I want to talk about this morning rich toward God means that we live faithfully that we live faithfully. So often we think of faith as faith in ourselves. That we get a certain confidence in ourselves because we've done things well. And we've had certain provision given our way. And that what we've done has been productive and we have faith toward self. Prosperity is what does that. But that's not what Jesus is talking about at all. It's not faith toward self. Now, you go a little deeper than that basic kind of having faith in yourself to having faith in, well, maybe what's right. A code. Principles. Well, that's that's a little bit better than faith in self, but that's still not what Jesus is pointing to here read a story. In 1962, a 14-year-old boy named Robert White wrote the president's secretary asking her for an autograph of the president. The president was John F. Kennedy. Well, Kennedy's secretary, Evelyn Lincoln, was tickled that a 14-year-old boy would be interested in the president. So she made a facsimile, a copy of the president's autograph. Well, that's what started it. From that point on, Robert White began to a correspondence with the president's secretary, asking her for for different things, memorabilia, and they would write back and forth. And sometimes she would give him doodles that the president had made during a meeting or or things that were going to be thrown away that the president said it was all right 
to send in. And over the years, all through his life, that he would collect up memorabilia of presidents. And when Robert White died, he had the largest collection of presidential memorabilia, over 50,000 pieces. The largest collection ever, private collection ever, of presidential memorabilia. Well, it started, it started with a relationship, with a relationship. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. That the relationship of faith is one of a friend sitting down at a meal with, a, with another. It's Jesus as a friend that we walk with. It's Jesus as the Lord that listens. It's a relationship. And God speaks to those who take time to listen. Relationships require time. And it's the, the giving of that time to dine, to walk, to listen. Is the relationship that opens the door to Jesus Christ in our lives. 1 Corinthians 2.12 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things freely given to us by God. That God has given us great prosperity, great bounty. And it's the spirit, not of the world, but the spirit from God. His Holy Spirit that lets us know the gifts of God. The bounty of God, the generousness of God. And we respond, giving in gratitude of our time, our talents, our gifts, and our service. And we live, live faithfully a life of, of gratitude, a life of gratitude, a life of faith. But not only does the life of faith give a life that rich, that's rich towards God. It's, it's also that we love boldly. We love boldly. Don Locker tells a story about a woman in his church who was moving from her home to assisted care living. She had many friends that were there in the assisted care living, and they were all excited to see her. They were so excited that they prepared a party, a banquet for her. They had balloons, they had a cake, and they had a seat at the table set aside just for her. And next to her chair was a, an older gentleman, handsome, very well dressed. And when she sat down, she couldn't get her eyes off of him. Well, so much so that he began to be a little uneasy. And she finally said, I'm so sorry. I keep staring at you, but you remind me so much of my second husband. He said, oh, how many times have you been married? She said, once. <laughs> well, that's bold, isn't it? Oh, it's a risky thing. She's sticking her neck out. And that's what love is. It's bold. It's risky. It's, 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 it's going out on a limb. It's sticking your neck out. A little while back, I told a story of, of a time when I was on a walk, and I saw a man sitting on a curb. And I didn't know what to do, uh, so I stopped and I, I just asked him if it'd be okay if I sat down next to him. I struck up a conversation. Well, several months later, a member of this church said, well, I rem my wife and I were driving and we remembered when you, you told that story. He said, we were kind of out in the middle of nowhere and there was this man sitting on a guardrail. He said, so we decided to, to kind of stick our neck out and we we pulled up and he said I asked the man are you okay and the man said no I'm not he said a little while back I had a heart attack and every day I've been walking a little and a little more and a little more and he said today I think I I walked too far and I don't have the energy to get back home the member of our church said could I give you a ride home the man said I'd love that he said, you're one of God's angels. Well, 
I don't know that we've been called to be angels, but I do know you and I have been called to be the light of the world. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. A light, a light in the dark places to let people know that you're not alone, that you matter to God. And it's whether we do it as individuals or whether we do it together, we're still called to be that, that light. And, I, and I'm struck how often, how often I hear, whether it's from someone that, that's taken part in, in one of our, our support groups, that every week we have 40 meetings here at this church of 25 different support groups that we have here at this church. Whether it's from someone in one of those support groups that says, your church, that all of us together have been alive. Your church let me know that I'm not alone when I was going through the loss of a child or recovering from addiction or through the loss of a, a spouse or through my divorce. That your church, your church, my church, that together, that for those folks we'd been alive. Or sometimes it's been folks in job networking. That while they were searching for a job, that this church, this church, whether as individuals or as a group, together let them know that they weren't alone in a scary time searching for a job. Or those that once a month, we give out to 200, over 200 families groceries and home goods to help the families who are in need. And sometimes I'll, I'll hear from those that they're so thankful to know they're not alone. Or sometimes it's been from people we've helped in other countries that feel like they're all alone. But you and me together have reached out to let them know that they're not alone. And we've been able to, to love and to, to love boldly together to let folks know that they're, they're not alone. Well, that requires more than just love of self. It's a love that goes beyond love of self or a love of a code. It's a love that that's risky, it's bold, it sticks its neck out. It's the light of the world. And you and I have call, been called to do e exactly that. And it makes us rich, rich, rich toward God. Rich toward God means that we live faithfully. It means that we love boldly. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning, it means that we, that we give and that we give generously. When I was in sixth grade, I wanted a dirt bike in the worst sort of way. I take that back. I wanted my father to buy me a dirt bike in the worst sort of way, but I knew that was never gonna happen. My father had told lots of stories about how much he hated motorcycles on the street. And his love for motorcycles on the dirt, well, it was just tolerable. He didn't like them much at all. But I thought, well, well maybe if I, I bought one by myself, that'd be okay. So I went to my dad and I said, Dad, would it be okay if I saved enough money to buy a dirt bike, if, if I bought one? Well, the prospects of a sixth grader earning enough money to, to buy a dirt bike on his own were just about zero. So dad said, sure. So I looked around for dis different ways to earn money. And I noticed that there was this, this kid in the neighborhood, Dwight, who had a paper route. He delivered to all the, the houses in our neighborhood and a couple of neighborhoods around us. And so I asked him, I said, how did you get to be a paper boy? He said, well, I got the route from my brother. He didn't want it. He said, you want this one? I don't want it anymore either. He said, I can ask my manager and, and maybe you can take it over. I said, that'd be great. So I asked my dad, I said, would it be all right if I, I became a, a paper boy for this neighborhood and the neighborhoods around there? Dad said, sure. So I started delivering the Atlanta Journal-Constitution every day and early on Sundays. Well, 
I didn't just deliver the paper and then the Atlanta Journal write me a check. I had to collect the money if I wanted to be paid. So the majority of my time was spent knocking on doors collecting $3.35 a month because I didn't get paid at all if I didn't get that $3.35 every month. Well, it was more than once that I knocked on a front door and I saw the light turn off inside, heard the back door close, and the car crank up. Folks running from the paper boy wanting $3.35 a month. But I was able to save a little money. And that's when my father taught me one of the things that in my life has been the most helpful. He said, when I was in sixth grade, he said, Tom, you know, you earn money so you can spend a little bit for yourself, so you can save a little bit, and you can give some to God. He said, but if you start with what you want, you're never going to save any and you're never going to give any to God. He said, start. Start giving 10%. Start it now and you'll be surprised. There's always enough to save and there'll always be enough for you. Well, that's when I started. Setting aside the, the first 10%, the first 10% for God, for the church. And to be honest with you, back then, it wasn't that hard. I mean, Dad put a roof over my head. Dad is the one that provided food for the table. That when it got hard was when I began in earning more money. It wasn't the adversity. It was the prosperity. It was when I began earning more money that... I began to think about all those things that I'd been doing without, all those things that, that I wanted that to be rich toward God is not to start with self. It's to start with God. To start with God to start with God means that we put aside our first fruits, not the leftovers, not the stuff that we aren't doing anything with, but the very first fruits. I want to invite you to give and to give generously what God's doing right here in the world. We put our little with God's much. And we've seen incredible things happen. I want to invite you to give, to continue to grow the student ministry here at this church. This year, we've had over 180 young people sign up for our small groups. We call them crew. It's the largest group we've ever had. This year, so far this year, this year alone, over 90 young people have made a first-time commitment to Jesus Christ in different retreat settings that we've had. Yes, we'll continue the support groups. Yes, we'll continue the job networking. Yes, we'll continue to, to give in missions around the world. But what we also want to do this year is, in 2023, is we want to hire someone that's a discipleship minister. That in community and faith, that they find ways to reach out to build the small group, to build the Sunday school, to build the community groups where people become rich toward God. And I want to invite you to, to take part in this. If you're online, it's rumc.com slash give. That you can take part in what God's doing in the world. It's easy enough to know what we want, to serve ourselves, but God asks the question. So is the man who is, lays up for himself treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. That where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And to love God with heart and soul and mind and strength means that we give to God first. 
I want to invite you into to that kind of gracious, gracious giving. Join with me in prayer. Let's pray. Jesus, there's this connection between our, our hearts and our wallets. And I don't know how it works. I just know that it does. And you tell us right here that, well, that's exactly the case. That it's in the giving. That our hearts are not turned over to selfish wants, but turned over to you. We also know that we're slow to do that. I ask that this morning that you give the grace, the strength, and the power of your Holy Spirit that we begin to open our hands and open our hearts to give generously to you. And a strange thing happens. A strange thing happens that when we give our hearts to you, you begin to open our eyes. Yes, as individuals and, and together as a church to look out into a world that we might love boldly together. And when we do that, very often it is that we begin to, to live faithfully in a relationship with you, that it's our, our time, our talent, our gifts, our service, that we begin to give and to give freely to you. Pour on us your grace. And Lord, may we not just be takers, but givers as well. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image, and what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir an organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.